So this is part two on the simple grid system screencast. And what this is is some basic ideas behind web design and implementing a grid that are helpful before we get into the, the third part, which is actually making the grid. So these are not the only ones. There's, there's a lot of other ideas, and, and I don't go them into full depth. But these are just some of the basics that I think you'll have to know before we go into the next section. So the first idea is that it's really all about the width. So for the simple grids that we're implementing here that are about vertical columns, what it's really about is defining the width of elements so that the width of the element fits into a set pattern that's defined by the grid. So really it's all about controlling the width in our CSS. So let me, I'll go back to that for a second. So what that means is, is that in the CSS you're going to see later on, it's all about saying, okay, how do we control that width? And also, in the other ideas that we're going to have to learn about with floats and things like that, uh, in the CSS box model, it's, it's what affects the width and, and how, how does that affect it. So the second part is you have to know your box model. In, in CSS and in HTML, everything is based on the box model in terms of how tall and how wide things are and what you can apply. So we're going to have to know a little bit about the box model. That's what web layout is based on, so we have to learn a few basic concepts. We're not learning everything right now, but we're going to learn a few. So we're going to uh, focus on the width and the float properties. Width, as I said before, is really what we're focusing on in general, and float we're going to focus on because we need that in order to actually make these columns sit next to each other. So let's first look at how your browser determines the width of an element. And there's two basic types of element in CS in uh, HTML, which are inline elements and block elements. And we're talking here about block elements, which are like paragraphs, divs, unordered lists, ordered lists, and so forth. Inline elements are elements that go within blocks and just sort of automatically line up next to each other. That could be text, it could be images, and so forth. So span the span element is the generic inline element. So let's look at how it happens. So first, when you set the width property with CSS, uh, you get a width. So here my CSS, I say width 200 pixels, I have a, a width for my box. Now, let's add some padding in there. So this has is padding right and padding left. What you're going to find is now the total width of the element is actually uh, 220 pixels. So this is incorrect right here. This should be 2. 20. I made a mistake, sorry. So it is the width of the inner part that we define with the width element plus the padding right and padding left on either side of it. So it, it's a total sum for everything. So that now there is 210 pixels wide. If we add borders in, that also adds to the width. So now our total width is 224 pixels. We have two pixels border on each side, 10 pixels of padding, plus our 200 pixel width for the element. So you see here that the width we're defining when we define CSS really defines just the content. Uh, and all the other stuff gets added on to it. So now we're going to go yet again and we add some margins. So you might have a margin on either side. So now the effective size of this is 254 pixels, which is the margins, borders, and padding, and width all added together. So one of the other things that people find that's often problematic is you define the width of an element, uh, and let's say you have an 800 pixel wide screen, and you have two elements, one that's 300 pixels wide, one that's 500 pixels wide, everything looks fine, and then you add some padding to the element, and now all of a sudden it breaks and the things don't fit, and that's because that padding you added now increased the width of whatever element you added the padding to, and it now breaks out of your 800 pixel wide screen. So using float. So that's width. Now we know that uh, how, how width is affected. Uh, oh, and I should, I should mention here that generally if you are going to add things to an element and you want the total width to stay with your what you originally thought was your width, let's say 200 pixels, every time we add something we'd have to subtract it. So in this case if we subtracted 54 pixels from the width uh, and and made it 146 pixels, 
then we would still have a total width of 200. So if we changed it so that this here was 146, then adding all these pieces onto the end of it would still leave us with a total width of 200. So that's basically how you can do it. If you're in that situation where you have to, for some reason, add padding or borders or margins to an element, and another common one is adding like a one pixel border and then it suddenly breaks. So if I added a two pixel border on each side, then I would change that to, you know, 196. I would subtract the four pixels from it and it would work there. So float. So float is something that changes the way block elements are laid out by the browser. Normally when you have a block level element, it just fills the amount of space it can within its containing element. Meaning, there's an element here represented by this, this dark line that is inside the other ones. And in, in often cases, you might have a div here, and then we have three divs on the inside, like that. All right, I'm just doing the opening element, but you guys get the picture. All right, well, I'll do the closing for the main one. So this, this div here is a containing element and these are inside of it. So that represents the containing element and then these three represent here. So those divs by default will all fit within the space that they're allowed. And this containing one even, if that was a div, would then fit within the larger one which everything is contained inside of, which is body. Right? So the width of the body would be the width of the cont containing element. Unless, <coughs> excuse me, you use the width property. So by default, they're 100%, but if you use the width property, so in this case here, we've set the width to 200 pixels for each one of these blocks, then it will get an hour. But you notice that they still have the second characteristic of a block level element, which is it forces all other content either above or below it, right? So that each, each of these blocks that we have here are on their own line. So that is the part that float changes. So in order to float, you need two things. You need a width defined, and then you need the float property applied. And once we apply the float onto these, then they, then they move up next to each other. So now we have this float left applied uh, to each one of these, and that moves them so that they're up next to each other. And that's essentially what float does. It just sort of floats them next to each other. You'll notice here, as I have in the note, that this the containing element now doesn't cover them. So one of the other things that happens when you float something is that the content now is not recognized by its containing element. So the containing element now, in trying to determine its height, won't pay attention to floated elements when it's looking for how tall it needs to be. So right now, this uh, containing element has no height to it. If we add more, then it will fit in the width. So in this case, we added a fourth element. <coughs> then that just simply moves down to the next line and keeps going. So as we add more boxes, if we're adding the same 200 pixel boxes, and we added divs, they would just keep laying themselves out like that. And it's true, if you increase the width of one element, it'll affect the other one. So in this case, you know, we increased this by 400 pixels, so that pushed it over. There was only room for one more, and then the other ones just sort of laid themselves out that way. So this is also how we're going to approach the grid. In, in other words, we can make elements, and, and they, we base the width of them on the grid, and then we make sure that we only have enough of those widths to fill the, the, width, the width of all these elements combined is the number of <coughs> widths for its containing element. All right, now one thing that you can also do with floats is use what's called a clear property. So what happened here is we applied a clear left to this box there. Uh, sorry, not that box. Um, let me erase that. We applied a clear left to this box here. And so what it meant is that this now moves down to the next line and clears the things that are floated before it. So it cleared this element and moved down to there, and then the other elements go went past it. And this is the other thing that we'll use when we're making our grid system, is that we'll use a clear 
to denote what the first item is in each row that we're doing. And it will make sure that it is the first item if you add a clear property to it when it moves um, down that way. And we're going to use the clear in a couple other situations as well. Well, at least one other situation. So, one other concept here. In order to get this containing element that we just saw to recognize its content, is you add what's called a clearing div. So this div right here is basically a div that has no content inside of it, has a class of clearing on it that clears the floats. So this clearing element now has no float applied to it, and because of that, the containing element recognizes it, and so it will stretch itself to fit that cleared element. And in doing so, it also fits the other elements that that were floated. So this is a common little trick if you need your containing box to, it has a border around it or a background color or a background image or something, and so it needs to stretch over your floated elements, you, you, you can use this clearing div. So the third idea is what I call untouchable divs. It's just something I kind of made up. And the idea here is uh, you always use divs to mark your major content areas, right? So here we have our header, side nav, content, sidebar, footer. Each of those has a div. And so these are what I would call untouchable divs in that we want to be able to set the width to these once and then not add any borders, margins, or padding to them. And the reason for that um, and, and the, the width would be done from the grid system that you're using, the CSS styles. And we'll look at that uh, a little later on. Uh, but basically, this, this div out here, we don't want to add any padding or borders to it because this has the width from our grid system, and we don't want to make that bigger or smaller. So what we do then is we add the padding, borders, um, etc. to our content area. And then the content can get that. And that's basically the idea of the untouchable grid. So again, coming back to that previous example, the reason that we can't add the left and right border padding is that will increase the overall width. So technically, yes, you can add it, but it ends up being a headache if you have to add that in and then subtract the width all the time in multiple places. If you want to break out of your box in one or two places and, and do it, that's that's okay. But in general, you want to try to avoid adding left and right border padding or margin. You can add top and bottom margin and padding without affecting the width of the columns. So go ahead and add those, that's fine. And in the examples we see later, we're going to do that, and that won't affect the width of your columns. So the third part will be actually making the grid. This ends the second part.